Please be seated. I'd like to welcome each one of you to the campus of Seattle Pacific University and to Ivy Cutting. This year is special as it marks the beginning of our 125th year, our Kwaskwa Centennial. I also want to recognize and welcome our class of 1966 who are here with us today celebrating their golden reunion. Welcome. <laughs> Ivy cutting is a tradition that began in 1922 when the senior class first planted ivy plants around Peterson Hall. Two years later, class president Martha Hopper was instrumental in initiating the first ivy cutting ceremony. In that first ceremony, they sang a song based on the poem by Charles Dickens titled, The Ivy Green. The poem speaks about the characteristics of ivy, its strength, tenacity, and how it can thrive when other plants cannot. From ivy to institution, SPU has indeed become a place associated with strength and perseverance, a place that has thrived and made a difference in our world. We are standing today where SPU began, Tiffany Loop. Looking around our beautiful surroundings, we can see and sense not only our university's history, but some of our foundational values and beliefs. Just inside the Loop's arch leading from Third Avenue is a towering white poplar tree. It is a tree that was living and present on our campus when our original building was constructed, Alexander Hall, just behind us, named after our first president, Alexander Beers. East at the top of the Loop is Peterson Hall, completed in 1905 and named after Nils Peterson, one of our founders who gave us our original five acres of land. This land that is now known as Tiffany Loop, named after Orrin and Grace Tiffany. Orrin, our second president, and Grace, his wife, who served as both dean of women and as an art faculty member. These buildings, space, and grounds provide the university a rootedness, and they offer foundational cornerstones, reflecting ideals, values, philosophies, and institutional commitments that have shaped our university's purpose and our potential. Holding this ceremony in this historical setting allows us to reflect on the meaning and purpose that surrounds us. Beyond the ivy that you will leave with today, I encourage you to carry on your life's journey, the ideals, the values, the beliefs that this setting, Tiffany Loop, offers to you and to our world. Carry in your heart the white poplar, which reminds us that there are those who have come before us and those that will come after. Be stewards of your time while offering beauty, nourishment, and shade for others along the way. Carry Alexander Hall, which reflects for us that all good things require sacrifice, boldness, determination, and courage. Carry Peterson Hall, which is a living testament to Nils Peterson's heart for missions, encouraging us to understand and engage the global nature, the cultural context, and the interconnectedness of our world. And carry Tiffany Loop, a setting that honors Grace Tiffany's selfless nature and service to others. Charles Dickens concludes the poem, The Ivy Green, with this stanza. Creeping where no life is seen, a rare old plant is the ivy green. It is my prayer that you go from this place, that you will carry life and hope into a world that desperately needs it. May you be rare by possessing the courage and the boldness to live a life for others, seeking to make a difference in our world. May God bless our time together this morning.
Good morning. Lord our God, we stand in your presence to thank you for all of the graduates before us today. We ask that you lay your almighty hand upon them and bless them in each way that they go. We thank you for all of their accomplishments, their victories, and their hard work. Bless them, Lord, in all of their future endeavors, wherever you may lead them. We ask that your word be a lamp, a lamp onto their light and their feet. And we ask that your light guide them in each decision that they make. As they embark on this next part of their journey, we ask that you help them stay true to their dreams and so follow your word in each part of their future. Let them look to the future and have hope, faith, and love. In your name we pray, amen. Please stand and join together in singing, Be Thou My Vision, the words on the back of the program. Good morning. My name is Chris Heron, and I, I have the privilege of presenting our senior class gift to Seattle Pacific University. This year, the Senior Gift Committee has elected to help fund the restoration and installation of two rare paintings by artist Charles Ethan Porter that were generously donated to the Johns Perkins Center. Porter, an artist supported and endorsed by Mark Twain, is considered to be one of the few African-American still life painters of the late 19th and early 20th century. These two pieces will be hung on the first floor of the Ames Library, and we believe this gift will resonate not only with the senior class, but also to the university as a whole for years to come. In assistance with Seattle community members who have agreed to match funds raised by students, faculty, and staff, we have raised $8,891. We as the Senior Gift Committee want to thank everyone who helped fund this gift. We are so grateful for our time at this incredible university, and we give this gift as a demonstration of our appreciation as our time as students, as well as the beginning of our class's legacy of support for our alma mater for years to come. Thank you so much and congratulations to the class of 2016. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, class of 2016, for your amazing support of SPU. We're very grateful. It's my privilege to welcome home the class of uh, 1966 for their 50-year reunion. Since 1922, Seattle Pacific's been honoring our graduates on campus with this ivy cutting ceremony, and so, 50 years ago today, this group stood where you now stand and took their own sprigs of ivy from this place 
to answer God's call to change the world. It's my privilege to know some of their stories and continue getting to know them. And I can tell you, they most certainly have made their alma mater proud. Well done, class of 1966. We are thrilled to have you back on campus again. Will you please rise so that we can celebrate and honor you? And to you, the class of 2016, as your new alumni director, I say congratulations. Your alma mater is proud of you. And while you are, we are confident, you too will go from this place with your sprigs of ivy today and bring change to wherever God plants you. We want you to know and remember that SPU is right here behind you. Uh, we are here to support you all the way. We encourage you to stay connected stay engaged with your alma mater and to take full advantage of all the benefits and resources of the SPU Alumni Association, an association nearly 45,000 members strong. We look forward to seeing you throughout your years as an alum at SPU alumni events and functions and SPU gatherings. And until then, may God bless your journey from this place. And I ask you to remember, once a falcon, always a falcon. Good morning. It's my privilege to be able to introduce our faculty speaker for this ceremony. But before doing so, let me say just a few words of thanks. I thank our musicians, the drum corps, the symphonic wind ensemble, under the leadership of Danny Helseth. I thanks to David Anderson for leading us in singing. I thank our incredible facilities crew for setting all of this up. I want to give a shout out to Michelle McFarland and her whole team for coordinating the logistics of this event and the commencements that follows. And I want to thank God for the weather. <laughs> it's my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Brian Chin. Dr. Chin is the Associate Professor of Music here. He's been on our faculty joining us in 2001, which I might add was a good year for SPU. He serves as Director of Instrumental Studies and Coordinator of Music Theory. He teaches many of the core music degree classes, including freshman oral skills and advanced music theory. He also directs our very innovative learning assistant program, which is actually helping to redefine the way music is taught in higher education. As an international trumpet soloist and advocate for new music, Dr. Chin has commissioned and premiered many works for trumpet. He serves as principal trumpet for the Tacoma Symphony Orchestra he records for film studio projects, performs regularly with the Seattle Symphony Orchestra, the Seattle Opera Orchestra. He has two solo recordings entitled Universal Language and Eventide. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brian Shin. To President Martin, Provost Van Duzer, members of the board, the esteemed and good-looking faculty of Seattle Pacific University, <laughs> and to the students and family of the graduating class of 2016. I am deeply honored for this privilege of speaking here today. I'm grateful for this opportunity and recognize the gravity of this moment. To the students graduating today, congratulations. You have made it, you've worked hard, engaged your brain, nurtured your spirit, and persevered as you jumped through the hoops. It is beautiful to stop and celebrate your achievements and to mark your accomplishment in ceremony. This ceremony symbolically cuts you free and sends you fearlessly off, cuts you free from that umbilical cord of the ivory tower to go do good work and to change the world. The reality of the situation, of course, is that today doesn't mark the end of anything, but the moment when your real work is beginning. And it can be terrifying, especially without a manual or syllabus with clear rubrics for determining success, <laughs> or a roadmap for navigating a full and engaged life. What I would like to share with you today is a conclusion and realization that I have come to 
in my own life and through my research. I'm going to share with you what I think is an extremely powerful tool in creating success in your life and living a life of purpose. This is a tool that each and every one of us possess. And when it comes down to it, we have all been using it all of our lives. This is a tool that I hope to inspire you to begin a practice of, to learn to utilize this tool as a motivator, a relationship builder, a spiritual guide, a compass for morality, and a metric for success. Think about what the following people have in common. Tiger Woods, Mozart, Prince, Russell Wilson, Kevin Spacey, and Wayne Gretzky. They all have <laughs> ridiculous amounts of seemingly natural and gifted superhuman talent. Those of you who have worked with me over the years know that I am obsessed with the concept of talent. Where does this ability come from? How do we get more of it? How can we learn to develop our talents? The brain research of the past decades has led to massive discoveries on how we learn and develop skill, and for the first time enable us to understand talent on a deep level. That ultimately, we have the ability to develop our own talent. We now know how it works. The idea of natural born God-given talent has actually been legitimately challenged. Yet, talent certainly exists. We see it every day in the work of our majors from the art department, the concert hall, the theater stage. We see it on the basketball court in Roy Brown, the successful businesses of our alumni, and in the classrooms across campus. And we have all seen that eight-year-old kid on the soccer field who dominates the competition with ease and with joy. The 10,000 hours of mastery role of Malcolm Gladwell and others has largely been accepted into the general culture ethos of learning, but it needs to have the following caveat. It needs to be 10,000 hours of deep learning. What does it mean to have deep learning, really deep learning? I know that Peyton Manning himself could teach me to throw a perfect spiral and I could practice football for 10,000 hours, and while I would get better, I guarantee that I would not be a world-class football player. The same thing would happen if I took financial lessons with Alan Greenspan or I studied law and politics with Barack Obama. Now, is this because God did not give me the gifts that I would need to succeed in these arenas? Perhaps. But mostly, it's because I don't care. <laughs> I can't see myself doing any of those things on a world-class level. My ability to really see myself succeeding brings a subtle shift to this deep learning concept that changes everything about the way we engage with our lives and find meaning and purpose. Wayne Gretzky, for those of you who don't know, is commonly regarded as the most talented hockey player the world has ever known, capable of seemingly magical moves on the ice. His parents tell of two-year-old little Wayne crying whenever the hockey game on the TV was changed. Later, he talked about his obsession with visualizing the puck flying around the ice and imagining new ways to manipulate the puck into the net. Michael Jordan used to visualize in real time performing a complete and idealized game before going out to the court and finding the zone, as he would call it. Later, he would describe the funny sensation of not knowing the difference between what he had imagined over the years and what was real. The famous hotel tycoon Conrad Hilton, used to play hotel manager as a kid and would imagine every detail of an ideal hotel experience from the perspective of his future guests. James Levine, the famous conductor of the Metropolitan Opera, used to imagine and build opera sets for famous scenes in shoeboxes as a seven-year-old. And as a young kid, I used to build imaginary musical instruments and embarrassingly, I confess that I used to design curriculums for imaginary art schools. <laughs> the one thing that is clear about talent is that it requires deep learning. And deep learning requires the secret sauce, imagination. We all have it. We all know it is there. 
And I'm not just talking about unicorns, rainbows, and lightsabers. As upstanding adults, we are generally not encouraged to indulge in childish fantasies, but still, we use this gift every day. We visualize ourselves in situations professional, social, intimate, and in play. We use our imagination to make the most of the thousand daily choices, like what to eat or what addictions to indulge in, as well as the major life decisions, like what work we will engage in and what relationships we will build. The problem is that most of the time, we do this in a reactionary and worrying way that keeps us from engaging, produces decisions rooted in fear, and creates tension in relationships in our community. For the most part, we as a culture have steered away from developing our gift of imagination as a proactive, effective, and positive tool for real use in business, life, and in community. To be clear, I'm not just talking about greatness in exceptional cases of demonstrable talent. I'm talking about the ability for all of us to fully engage with the world and the people around us and to lead lives of exceptional purpose. With this metric for success, we simply cannot fail. But the thing about imagination is that it's like a muscle that can be strengthened or atrophied. Within us lies God's deep and powerful tool that for the most part has not been fully developed or fully utilized. Of course, I come to you from my background in the arts where imagination is at least encouraged from time to time. But this affects all of us and all of our disciplines and has the potential to legitimately change our lives and hence the world. Here are only a few ideas that I humbly submit to you day, today to strengthen this imagination muscle. Number one, Practice. Practice is ultimately more than a means to perfecting a skill or honing your craft. Practice is an ongoing and conscious decision on how you want to live your life. Practice is an ongoing and conscious decision on how you want to live your life. You can practice yoga, and we have spiritual practices, knowing that these are ongoing, lifelong pursuits. One of the ways that we can empower our gift of imagination is to practice it. Try this 10 ideas exercise that I stole from our business folks down the street. Simply force yourself to write down 10 ideas about anything every day during breakfast. You are likely to get one good idea every so often. And this simple act of active brainstorming can create amazing change in your life. Number two, consume less make more. We live in a time where I have all of the world's cumulative knowledge easily accessible from the phone in my pocket. In the age of YouTube, Netflix, Spotify, Kindle, ESPN, and Facebook, why would anybody ever need to create anything else? It is easy to fall into the next video game, or the next show to binge on, or the tyranny of the next urgent email. Instead, start making more stuff. Good food, good conversation. Develop your craft. Write down your ideas, help a neighbor, learn an instrument, create for the sake of creating. Consume less, make more. Number three, ask the right questions every day. This is where your critical thinking training comes in rather than thinking, why am I not happy? Why is that person out to get me? Why does my partner always, why don't I ever have time to? Start asking, what would happen if I? How can I better help create a scenario for those around me to flourish? Can I see it? Can I imagine it? What world of peace and cultural reconciliation, what would that world actually look like? Can we see it? What world do I want to leave for my children? If we all start to ask the right questions and engage our collective imaginations, amazing things and positive changes will happen. Look to your left. Actually do it, I know that's rhetoric, but look to your left. Look to your right, behind you, all of us, right? 
These are the people that will change the world with you. I am convinced on a thousand different levels that imagination is the key. Ultimately, the question evolves from what can you imagine to what can we imagine? Well, we come now to the moment in our ceremony where we ring what we have come to call the legacy bell. As Dr. Martin noted at the uh, beginning of this service, we are in our 125th anniversary. We were a university founded in 1891, and it seems entirely appropriate that this bell that we will ring was cast in 1891. The ringing of the bell has been part of our ceremony for a long time, and it marks the exits of our graduates into the world, but also commemorates and honors the thousands and thousands of alumni who have gone before them. So as is our tradition, the bell is rung by legacy students, that is students who have had a parent or grandparent, great-grandparent, or so on, who have graduated from SPU before them. And this year, we are privileged to have the bell rung by a fourth generation SPU graduate, Annalise Hurd, and I think the first time ever in this category, a fifth generation SPU graduate, Tucker Goodman. Two years ago, we also began a new tradition of honoring our first generation students. These are students who will be the first in their families to graduate from college. This year, we are graduating 152 first generation students. We have been extraordinarily enriched by their presence with us and will miss them greatly. And ringing the bell on behalf of these students will be first generation college graduate, Nakaira Petty. So let me invite the bell ringers to come over and ring the bell. And we now come to the ritual of the cutting of the ivy. And so at this time, I'd like to ask President Martin, Vice President for Student Life, Jeff Jordan, and Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, Cindy Price, to join our five retiring faculty members, Carrie Dearborn, Ed Smith, Kathleen Braden, Steve Lehman, and Eric Hansen, if you could take your places around the circle. And I'd like to invite you seniors now to reach down in front of you and pick up the ring of ivy and hold it out in front of you. And while our ivy cutters are making their way around the circle, let me just remind you seniors of something that probably you'll have some vague recollection from the mists of time. When you first joined this community, many of you participated in our new student convocation. And the new student convocation, if you may remember, involved the faculty forming a big circle around the floor of the gym. And you who were seated in the bleachers came down into that circle, marking your joining into and participating in the life of this community. But now the tables are reversed. We're at the end of your college career. And in this context, you'll see the faculty are in the middle of the circle and you're standing around the outside. And it's as if really the only thing still holding you in place is this string of ivy. And so as we cut the ivy today, we release you into the world. But we release you hopefully of holding something in your hand as a reminder that you do not go alone. You go with our prayers. You go with God's blessing, and even as you leave this physical campus, you are not leaving our community. 
Seniors, we want you to know that we are very, very proud of you and very excited to see what God's going to be doing in the next chapter of your lives. So let me give you just a couple other words of instructions. After the ivy has been cut, we ask that the seniors stay in the circle and that our guests remain in place. I know that the desire to jump up and take a photo is almost irresistible, but be strong. <laughs> Stand firm against that because when the ivy is cutting is done, we will all rise in place to sing our closing hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness and then stay in standing to receive the benediction this year given by Dr. Jeff Jordan, Vice President for Student Life and very proud parent of graduating, Josh Jordan. So let's begin with the ivy cutting.
Let us end with our benediction. God, we are grateful for your presence with us this morning. We have been grateful for your presence through the journeys for each of these students over the past few years at Seattle Pacific University. We are grateful for the minds, bodies, and souls that have changed, that have been developed from learning with faculty, staff, and fellow students. We are thankful for their ability to imagine today and in the coming days. We are grateful for the ways the SPU community has been changed by these students who have imagined and provided light to all of us, our community, our families, our workplaces, and our worship places. As we leave this place today, let us continue our learning. Let us continue to imagine and let us continue to be a torch that brings light to shine in this world. And may your spirit fan the, flam, fan the flames of our learning and our imaginations as these are gifts from God. And may we have a spirit of power, a spirit of self-discipline, and a spirit of love that will bear your image for your glory and honor in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, you can move now. Take pictures. <laughs> <laughs>